So, the second-hand game retailer CEX have created a new category on their website for rare games on certain retro consoles. Think Xbox rarities, GameCube rarities, and what I want to look at today, PlayStation 2 rarities. Hey, it's the console I grew up with, and if this video does well, maybe I'll do the other ones, who knows. I can only imagine this is to help the people in the shops know which games to put out on the shelves to get all sticky and felt up and nasty, and which ones need to be kept behind glass under lock and key. It makes sense, and it's fun to browse the new collection, particularly when you filter from highest to lowest price. And that's exactly what I did. So let's take a look at some of the most expensive games on PS2 according to CEX, how much they cost, and whether they live up to their beefy price tags. Spoiler, they don't. They just don't. Okay, so we're gonna start there. Gun Club, where you can live out your dream of being a gun collector without ever having to leave your couch. What the fuck is a it's probably also worth mentioning that in the land of the free, it's called NRA Gun Club. Yep, the super problematic, the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is with a good guy with a gun, NRA. Look, it's just a shooting range simulator, letting you run around with a bunch of realistic guns as you shoot targets. So what's the reason for it being so expensive? Well, there's just hardly any British copies around, and not just because we solve our problems with Wit and T rather than AR-15s. Although not officially released in the UK, a few PAL UK units have been found in circulation, and they can now set you back, oh my god, £800. Fuck. Yeah, don't pay that. This game sucks, and even IGN only gave it 1.5, so you know it sucks. God. And for the record, I know normally for these kinds of listicle videos, you start with the lowest price and you work up to the most ridiculous expensive price, but there is a very specific reason that I'm doing it the other way around this time, and you will see with the last entry, so stick around. Next up we have Kuon, which transports you back to a haunted feudal Japan, a setting as obscure as the game's marketing availability. With its blend of horror and Japanese folklore, it's like an interactive ghost story told by someone who really hates you. The game's price skyrocketed due to its limited release and pretty niche appeal, making it a sought-after relic for horror aficionados who like their scares wrapped in a little bit of Japanese history. But it's honestly another one you don't really need to seek out, as both the combat and puzzles are far below other games from the time. And with it costing £750, I'd rather buy 1500 copies of SingStar Take That, thank you very much. This is my idea of a very nice day out. Oh hey, it's Rule of Rose. I've already made a video about this game and its insane price tag. Okay, I'll give you a little taste of it now, but you gotta promise me you'll watch that video next, okay? Promise? All right. In Rule of Rose, you navigate the psychological horrors of the 1930s, dealing with disturbing themes like childhood trauma, and in some ways is like an even more messed up version of Lord of the Flies. Controversial at release, it was pulled from shelves faster than you can say bad press, and this limited availability, coupled with the overblown outrage, makes it a hot commodity for collectors who really love their PS2 era horror. And I mean really love, because £625? Yeah, nah. A Michigan report from hell puts you in the shoes of a journalist documenting a city gone mad. Imagine a B-movie horror flick, but you're the poor sap holding the camera, capturing all the chaos and horror firsthand. The game's scarcity and unique first-person perspective have turned it into a pricey collector's item, coveted by enthusiasts that, let's be honest, have more money than sense. Think of it kind of like a video nasty that's been out of print for decades, with an eerie atmosphere and an unsettling narrative that can't help but pull you in. And much like those video nasties, Michigan Report from Hell has a certain charm that makes it memorable, and I quite liked it for trying something different. The experience of navigating through a deranged city while trying to document the truth, it's, yeah, it's pretty scary. Is it worth £575? No, obviously not but it is one of the best games on this list. So next up we've got Silent Hill Shattered Memories, which reimagines the original game with a psychological twist that adapts to your choices. As you progress through the game, your decisions shape the storyline and character interactions, ultimately leading to one of five distinct and different endings. And this innovative approach provides a refreshing take on the classic series, adding layers of depth and replayability. Combine this with relatively low production numbers on PS2, and these unique features have made it quite the pricey acquisition. 
Dylan, and I can kind of see why, as it really stands out, not just for its chilling atmosphere and intriguing story, but also for its ability to adapt and personalise the horror experience based on your choices. Kind of like those old choose your own adventure stories you used to get as a kid that I absolutely cheated with every time I read it. But as for the game, it's £440 for a British copy, although the Peggy version is a little cheaper. But either way, you can get it on other consoles or digitally pretty easy and legitimately, so do that instead. Uh, now I'm going to talk about the game that makes me want to say bruv and geezer more than any game I've ever played in my life. One of the better GTA clones of the time, the getaway allows you to wander through a gritty, crime-ridden London fulfilling all of your gangster aspirations. And it might be because I personally know London better than any of the city's GTA parodies, but I have such a soft spot for the getaway, and I'm sad that there hasn't been any more games in the series. So this limited edition version was made to celebrate 100 million PS2 discs being made, and was itself limited to a run of 1,000, which is why a mint copy will set you back £295. But as far as I can tell, the only difference between this version and the normal version is the cover, so do yourself a favour and please just buy the normal version for £4. In Samurai Western, you play as a katana wielding samurai in the Old West. Kinda does what it says on the tin. And this unique setting combines the elegance and precision of samurai combat with the rugged, untamed frontier of the American West. And it's another game on this list that I've really enjoyed checking out. The thrill of slicing through bandits and outlaws with your katana while navigating dusty towns and desolate landscapes is incredibly satisfying. However, being an Atlas game, and a pretty obscure one at that, it was bound to get pretty expensive pretty fast. Atlas is known for producing niche titles that often gain cult followings, and Samurai Western is no exception. Its rarity and distinctiveness have made it a sought-after gem among collectors and enthusiasts, contributing to its seemingly still escalating value in the market. The game's unique concept and engaging gameplay have left a lasting impression on those fortunate enough to experience it. £270 for this one, but one to check out if you have other means to play it. So, like other games in the series, 2005's Armored Core Last Raven lets you customise your mech and dive into complex battles that will challenge your strategic thinking. As the final entry in the series on the PS2, its value has increased due to its comprehensive mech customization options and the devoted fanbase that refuses to let go. Fun fact, it was also the debut project for Mr. Miyazaki, the sadist behind Dark Souls. So as you can probably tell, I don't really know much about the Armored Core games, they're not really my thing. But even if they were £210, it's a bit much. Oh, we're nearly done. The Samurai Showdown Anthology is a collection of classic fighting games that aren't Street Fighter or Tekken, so make of that what you will. Look, maybe that's harsh, but honestly, does anyone actually remember these games? I mean, clearly someone does, because this anthology fetches £195. Jeez. But split that over the six games in the collection, and it averages out at £32.50 each. So that's good, right? R right? Oh god, let's just get on with the last one. Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys. Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys. Christ. This mix of awful animation next to non-existent gameplay and just general stank ass is worth £190. If you own this and paid real money for it, please do get in touch. I want to know if you actually exist. I really, really hope you don't. And now you see why I wanted to do this list in this order, because god damn. Oh. So that's the most expensive, rarest PS2 games in the UK according to CEX. And if we've learned anything, it's that price doesn't equate to quality. But hey, if you've got any of these lying around from back in the day, get that bag and sell them while they're hot, please. And if you don't own any of them but still want to check them out, please don't be deranged. Get yourself an emulator and put your money to something more useful. You know, I'm thinking like a nice mid-range toaster or maybe 1,000 copies of the 2004 Athens Olympics game. You know it makes sense. And before you go, make sure to like and subscribe for plenty more on all things gaming. Check out our movie channel, UDS Films, and visit UpsideDownShark.com for everything else. Until then, my name is Tom, this has been UDS, and we'll see you next time. Ah, oh, Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys, Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sad now.